Hello everybody, my name is Dr. Lincoln Thomas, and today we're going to be covering in the uh, cold and flu symptomology and actually how to take care of those. Uh, so first things first, you need to have a little bit of an anatomy lesson, so we're going to send you off for that. We'll be back in just a couple minutes. All right, everybody, we're going to do a quick little bit of an anatomy lesson so you know the areas that we're talking about in the upper cervical. So as we kind of take a look at the neck right in through here, the main muscles that we're looking at that are dealing with these areas, you've got the sternocleidomastoid right here. This muscle tends to pull the head backwards, which actually loads up the upper, upper cervical. It's a very tight muscle area. So we're going to hide that one out so you can look underneath it. Uh, you've got right in beside it here, you've got this one called the uh, splenius capitis. Again, tugs the skull, starts pulling it back into the neck. As it does that sort of motion, it can actually load it up so much, it causes those irritated patterns that we're talking about again. You've got down here, which is the splenius cervices, same sort of thing, it loads up in the upper cervical there, starts tugging it back in the neck. It really makes it a bad environment for these areas right in through here. So we're going to hide that one out there, and then you've got this one here, which is the semispinalis capitis. Again, it starts pulling the skull backwards, it starts loading up those upper cervical joints. Now that we actually have those out of the way, you can see the muscles underneath it. So there's the big ones we're looking at, and here's the muscles underneath it, the ones we're caring about here. We've got this one right here called levator scapula. That lifts the shoulder blade up, and again, starts tugging onto the neck when we do that. So if your shoulder blades are tight, we carry stress on our neck shoulders. That's going to load that area up and add more tension to the upper cervical. You've got your scaling tissues here. You've got your posterior, you've got your middle, you've got your anterior scalings. And these muscles right in through here, these ones will actually load up that muscle area right up to here, which is going to cause that upper cervical dysfunction here. So again, what we're dealing with in chiropractic, we're really looking at nerves more than anything else. When you look at how these things work, the C2 area will start actually sending signals up towards the eyes. Uh, C3 is going to be more towards the nose area that you're dealing with things. Uh, C4 starts getting to mouth. Five starts throwing issues going down your arms, stuff like that. So these are all nerve root stuff. And it's these upper cervical ones. That's the stuff that's causing the symptomology that we feel up and through here. Now that we know that, that's your anatomy lesson. Now we can head back and start covering how to do the treatments. Hopefully that was a great anatomy lesson. Now we've got to cover about what we've got to do with those sort of things. Uh, first things first, just to understand, I, I'm a chiropractic physician. I've been doing this stuff for about 20 years. Uh, I don't know what your understanding is for chiropractors, but our number one goal is to nerve function more than anything else. We want to make sure your brain is sending a signal down to your body, your body to the brain, and a two-way transmission. If that transmission is in place, you look fine. If you have a bad signal going down or a bad signal going up, that's when something weird happens, like an arm on a chair effect. The arm on a chair effect is you take your arm and put an arm on a chair and leave it there for a while. What happens to your arm? People say, Dot, and your arm goes numb. Do a lot of weird things at that point in your body. Numbness, weakness, tingling, pain, turn blue. Those are all symptoms. So if I take my arm off the chair, that arm should go back to normal. That's why well, it's the same sort of thing that we're looking at when we deal with these cold foods symptomologies. That's exactly what those are. These are symptoms and not the problems themselves. Uh, I didn't say that bacteria and viruses aren't real. No, absolutely they are. But the thing I always say is that the cold flu symptomology is just that, symptomology of irritated patterns. So uh, uh, about two and a half years ago, uh, after uh, New Year's, I had actually uh, quite a few patients come in with cold flus. So what I did was I checked them out with a fine tooth comb to see exactly what's going on. Not a really accurate comb. But anyways, what I did was I checked them out and literally every single person had these areas locked up right into the, the muscles that I'm talking about. So what we do is we have people come in sicker than a dog and you have them leave without a cold flu. Uh, yes, have them leave with all the cold food. What I mean by that is that I had to chase the bugs out of her throat. What I did was I actually helped to alleviate the symptom that she was actually manifesting like that arm on the chair effect. So once you understand that sort of aspect, these things are possible to get into better patterns. Now you do have to understand, if you just expect to do a stretch and get your body out of these patterns, that's not reality. You gotta make sure your body's working good on the inside too to actually accept the things that we're doing for it. If you don't have the fuels on the inside, things don't work properly. Imagine like your car, I have no gas, I have no engine oil, I have no, uh, no uh, brake fluid, I have no uh, water in the radiator. Then you can't make the vehicle run for at least short periods of time because it's gonna, it's gonna die out. So what you gotta do is you gotta have the right fuels in the right areas. I can't take gas in and throw it inside your radiator. I can't take engine oil, throw it inside my wood washer fluid or throw it inside my, my gas tank. You got the right fuels for the right areas. And that's what I'm saying is when you're dealing with the the, uh, uh, the flu aspects in general, these things are usually governed by water. Uh, almost every single patient that I've seen that actually has lung issues, uh, most of these people in general are dehydrated. And that's why I say is when you look at the bronchic pace, look at bronchitis, look at the pneumonia, look at asthma, allergies, these people are all showing signs of dehydration. So the first thing you need to do is make sure you actually have enough hydration in your body. That's about two to four liters per day, every day. And if you have coffee, pop, tea, alcohol, that's two cups of water to counteract each one of those bad things you've had. So if I have one cup of coffee, that means I have two cups of water to counteract that coffee. And this is above and beyond the two to four liters we talk about per day. So you need to be working on other things too to get your body working better. So now we can get into the stretching aspects. So first things first, you wanna take your head, you wanna force, uh, put it forward here, and then put an ear down to your shoulder, and you turn your head left and right and see how it feels. 
Let your head forward, put your ear down to your shoulder, turn left and right and see how it feels, looking for the tightest areas. Now, again, when I'm saying these things, it's flex your head down, ear to your shoulder, you do not turn your face. I don't go like this and turn my face to that side. That is gonna line up those muscles completely different. You're gonna be stretching a different area. So we gotta get this done specifically. Head forward, ear to your shoulder, turn left and right, how tight, head forward, left and left right, see how it feels uh, for the tension. Uh, so we're gonna assume we actually did the one side already. You wanna do both sides, tight side last. So if I do my tight side right now, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna find out where it's most tight. I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna hold it right there. I'll drop my shoulder away from my head. I'll pull my head away from the shoulder in that position. Take a deep breath in, hold that in for eight to 10 seconds, stretch those fibers out. Once I'm done those fiber stretches, I breathe out, repeat the process on that side. Left, right, left, right, where it's most tight, the same spot. Put in that same spot again, stretch them apart, deep breath in, eight to 10 seconds. You might notice that you might do the same sort of pattern three, four times in a row. You might even notice you might do the same sort of pattern for a couple days. But sooner or later, that thing is going to unlock. When it unlocks, you'll go like this. You'll be like, oh, it's tight right there. After you do that little stretch, you breathe out. You say, where is it at now? He's like, huh, it's not there anymore. Oh, now it's when I turn down here. Fine, if that's where it is, and that's where you put your head to, drop the shoulder down away from the head, pull the head away from the shoulder. But again, same sort of thing. We're really trying to get that maximized muscle area right here. So again, not face, ear. We're doing that stuff, okay? Not face to the area, ear to the area, and then you rotate. So again, get those stretched out like that. This is like bowling. So if I'm playing bowling, what I want to do is I bowl, roll that ball down the alleyway. Uh, I want to try and get a strike to get that high score point, to try and win the game. It's kind of what we're doing here. If I go and I don't get that strike, what I do is I take out half the pins there. Then what we're going to do is going to try and go for a spare. If I'm going to go for a spare, what am I going to go for? The highest ranking pin or the lowest ranking pin? If I go for the lowest ranking pin, there's no way that's going to jump backwards and actually hit the rest of those pins to take them out. What we've got to do is pick the highest ranking pin next, and hopefully it'll take out all the pins behind it. The same sort of thing with those stretches here. Have to take that tightest muscle, and if we get that thing stretched out, there's a good chance we're going to get these other ones stretched out too. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense for you right there. Now, after you've done that stretch, you need to go into a corner and counteract that stretch. We're doing forward motioning, and anything that you've heard about over the internet, not good for forward motion. Text necky, type in on a computer, crank your head down, watching TV through your feet as you were laying down in your bed. These are all gonna crank your head forward. You gotta get into a better state of balance. So after you do that stretch, it's also pulling you forward. So you've gotta pull that one out. Get your arms up to a shoulder width right in here, not out, not in. And you have a slight little flat out on your elbows. Go into a corner, lean into the corner, look up, take a deep breath in, stretch out that neck shoulder area for about 10, 20 seconds right there. After you've done that sort of thing here, you can go to bed right after that. Most of my patients usually do a, a really good recovery on these sort of things and usually bounce back pretty fast. Usually by the next day, they usually feel pretty good. Sometimes right after the stretch, they feel good. But I gotta tell you, if that fire has been going on for like, you know, five days or something like that, I always talk about fire like a fire in the back room. If I have a fire stuck in my back room, put it out right away, it's probably business is normal in that room. That, if that fire's been going on for five minutes, 15 minutes or something like that, and besides put it out at that point, it's probably not gonna be business as normal. You got fire damage, water damage, smoke damage. You gotta fix that room up first before it comes to the functional area, gets the same sort of thing with your body. If you've been suffering with the cold through for about five days or something like that, this is not gonna go away instantaneously. You got all this crud buildup, you gotta clean that stuff out. But if it starts up right away, you do these stretches away, you're working on your dietary stuff, there's a really good chance you're gonna go right back to your regular patterns. Because again, I haven't had a cold foot in about 10 years and I see sick people all the time. Nothing special about me, I just practice what I preach. So, hope you like the information we talked about here. You got the family, friends who suffer from uh, cold flu symptomologies. Please send this video off to them. Help them reduce that chances of, uh, of getting affected that way or, or have to deal with all those symptoms because it doesn't feel great. And at the same point, you love the information we have. Come on back because we're going to be giving you new information all the time that's going to actually help to get that body and body to a better, better pattern. We're all about human potential here at Thrive Wells. So, come on back. We'll talk to you soon. All right. See you back.